What's up everybody? 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 Okay guys, what's up? Here we go. Jedi Nightwalker, Words to Samo, Zmarber69, What's Crackalack and Zave 10 photos. Cello, what's up? Manual, what's up? Sinister Monopoly, what's up? See what name? What's up? What's up? Okay, guys. All right, I just got to the phone. Sinister, Sinister Monopoly. We're gonna go live in two seconds. Let me just wave at this dude. What's up? Everybody's just kind of coming on right now, but we're gonna go live with this dude right here. Manny, Manny, man. What up? What up? What up? Here we go. Make sure my volume's okay. Hey, what's up, brother? Hey, how are you? Good morning. How you doing, man? I'm good at yourself. I'm just getting back from a walk, I'm trying to set up my phone here, and my my table goes down. See that? That's kind of cool. Okay. Look at that. Ooh. Yeah. What's up, Jada Fire? Jada Fire and the Hizzy. Whirlwind Dreamer. Kev from Vegas. Okay, guys. So. Today we got Sinister Monopoly. What's your real name, bro? My first, my real name's Jason. The last name's Barber. Jason Barber, dude. So you hit me up just to tell the kind, of, just to tell what transpired. Sure. You hit me up uh, as a fan and asked to be on the show, and I was like, "Who is this dude?" And then I researched you. Uh, I deep dove into your life which is really fascinating. You're, you kind of, you, you had a very movie-like life. I mean, as much as people have turned stories into fiction or real stories into fiction, one of, your story really needs to be a movie because it has For sure. the drama and the theatrics uh, of a movie. And Absolutely. what has happened in your life is crazy. Shout out to Marlon Wayans, my brother, great actor himself. Wow, all right. Uh, and also, Marlon and I went to the same high school. I went there a couple of years before him. And yeah, right. Arts. But, yo, tell, tell your story and, and just, just really tell us what was your, were you like the biggest mover of marijuana in California? What is your claim to fame in the, sure. other, in the underground clandestine drug world? Sure. So uh, back in 2010, I'll just kind of start there. I was eventually like um, under investigation from the, 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 the government, right? The FBI, the feds. And so if we backtrack to that, I, you know, I'll just speculate and say that at that moment in like probably 2007 to 2011, I was probably the biggest pot dealer in America, I would speculate. Because what, at my, in the, the full spectrum of when I was in like, just going hard and heavy, I, I owned um, three private airplanes. So I, I wasn't a pilot, but I, um, I had pilots that worked for me. And on any given day, we would send out, you know, three to 400 pounds all over the US. I mean, at, at one point it was 11 states. And I, what I was doing is I imported the, um, the cannabis from Canada. And in Canada, without mentioning names, I work with probably the world's biggest, like 1% motorcycle club. So it wasn't like I worked with one individual, you know, I worked with like probably the most high, high ranking person within the club. And, you know, they would send over the, over the Canadian border in Vancouver into America they would send over maybe like 1,700 pounds every couple of days. And within that, that load, I generally would probably get, you know, three to 500 every few days for myself. And so, so, so before we go into that, I want to talk about, because you're, right now you're an artist and you've come so far in your life and career to, sure. become, to become an artist. But before any of that, look, I want to hear about your rise. Like, where does this shit start? Because, like, you know, I was selling nickel bags in New York City on the lowest, <laughs> you know what I mean, on the lowest yeah. level. I was mostly sure. buying. But I was, you know, 
you, you sell a nickel back to your homie. You know, I'm, I'm a teenage kid growing up in Harlem. Yeah. I had a whole different story, but your story starts because you're selling car radios and then you get a crazy opportunity to start moving weed. Sure. Talk about that. Cause that's crazy. So it kind of actually has a, has a, um, it's like similar to the, to Boston George in the movie blow in the sense that, um, I'm from Manhattan Beach, California, and if you, if anybody recalls in that movie, it even steps, says in the beginning that he's in Manhattan Beach, California. So it's a, it's an upscale area. It's similar to like a Beverly Hills, but a, you know it's a beach community. And so I started out uh, on my block where I lived. I had um, an older an older kid who wasn't much older than I was, and we started kind of you know being friends because we lived on the same block. Well, he, you know, he smoked on a regular basis and then kind of encouraged me and got me into smoking as well. So through like high school, I would also kind of like sell, like you're saying, like smaller bags or whatever, just so I could have like a little bit of personal to smoke for myself. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, I kind of grew up through like an entrepreneur um, background. So when I was younger, like at this time in high school, my dad owned um, dry cleaning businesses and he had them all over the South Bay, which we call like Hermosa Beach, Redondo Beach. So it, I worked in his dry cleaners and then eventually, like what you're saying is I, I opened up my own window tint shop and alarms and, and then detailing. And so what comes along with that is a lot of the neighborhood drug dealers would come to my shop and start buying, you know, car stereos. And so then I started kind of seeing like, wow, this dude's coming over here in this car and the cash he's pulling out. And to some degree, like those guys, the price didn't matter. So as I kind of like started dealing and becoming friends with some of these guys through them bringing in their, their cars for, you know, stereos and whatnot, um, I just started kind of like, somebody started giving me marijuana on a large level. Like, oh, here's, you know, five pounds. And then I would go and give them to my, my childhood friends that I grew up with. And, and most of the time or all the time, it was always on like a credit. Like if I knew you and you said, oh, yeah, I know some people, I would just give it to you on a line of credit and say, oh, you know, you owe me 30000 I lost you. I'm here. Oh, Ooh. okay. Your camera flipped. Um, all good. So that's kind of how it started. And then it just escalated into eventually um, uh, I, I ended up meeting some of the Canadians. And the Canadians go like what, what I would call like really hard and heavy, you know, like locally, maybe, you know, your friends that you grew up with might say, oh, I, you know, I grew some, I have five pounds or 10 pounds. But then when you're working with like a motorcycle club, they're like, you know, we have thousands and hundreds of them. And, and, and then they just started, um, a friend of mine, like kind of introduced me to one of those guys. And right out the gate, he gave me um, an encrypted Blackberry and it's referred to as PGP encryption. So once mm. we went back up to Canada, I started communicating with uh, this encrypted phone and it just became huge. And then I started traveling up there to like play golf and go snowboarding. And as I did that, it just, I, I met more and more Canadians. And are we talking about, are we talking about the direct line in Vancouver? Are you talking about Toronto, Montreal, or is it, is this Vancouver? Vancouver. Yeah. That's what I thought. Okay. Exactly, yeah. So, so they it, started, so they started to trust you and you started to move. They would give you weed to move in California. Is that how it went? Yes. yes. Okay. So then you would, you would give it to your people, runners or whoever, and then they would start selling it. And that, that was that made you kind of like top of the food chain, right? Exactly. So I just kind of started out of like a window tent car stereo shop. My friends would come by and next thing you know, I'd say, oh, I have this and they would be interested. And it was like, back then it was, you know, um, an extra way for people to make a little bit of extra money. So it was a lot, oftentimes, you know, childhood friends that I went to high school with. And the funny thing is, you know, I'm a, like, I'm a seventies child. So when I was young, I, was, I would play Little League and my parents were divorced and I would go to my dad's house on the weekends and my dad would smoke. And, you know, I don't know that he was like, he wouldn't like push it on me to see, but I could just smell that distinct smell, right? And then I would travel to his house on the weekends and I remember, I recall one time going to the refrigerator and, and there was brownies in there and I was like, oh, brownies. And he's like, oh no, those are adult brownies. You know, so it was kind of somewhat 
you know, prevalent around my house to some degree, and then through my friends. So, but just, just to clarify, because someone said, how's he able to talk about this without worrying about it? I mean, it seemed like you talk about this on YouTube. You, sure. you, already ser you already served time in federal penitentiary, right? I mean, yeah. this is like, this is everything you can talk about legally without, you know, incriminating yourself whatsoever, correct? Sure. So, um, I am able to talk about it because eventually in 2011, um, I, I was like captured by the FBI. And, and, and that is a unique story. I was in Atlanta and every guy- well, well, let's, not, let's not go there yet. Let me, let me still okay. keep the rise of, of okay. Sinister Monopoly, because hold on. Where, but, this, but I, was, yeah, yeah. I was sentenced to over 11 years as a first offender nonviolent. Okay, so, and you were just selling weed, right? Which is-, is yeah, I actually, at, at one point, the Canadians came to me and, and we would meet oftentimes at the UFC in Las Vegas and we would have like our sit down meetings. And so at one point the Canadians came to me and it, it was funny how these meetings would transpire. There would be like, like seven bikers and, and we would be in high end. <laughs> I would be just by myself. Like I don't roll with an entourage, you know? That's and crazy. Everyone's, everyone's pulling the batteries out of their phone. Everyone's patting down. Even in these rooms, we're doing hand signals. Like when we're talking yeah. about, you know, club members, we pat ourselves on the back. Like there's like, even in the room, there's these things that go around that are very like secretive and, and, and things, you know? So um, at one point, one of the, the main guys said, we can't send you anymore. And, and I was like, oh, you know, like I'm not ready to retire. And at that point I had already opened up United States market, like sending it what I call out of town. Mm -hmm. And I never let them knew that because I didn't want them to know that potentially that could be a problem sending it so far away. Mm -hmm. you know, they always just knew that it was in my backyard. So anyways, the guy said to me, and he's like, hey, uh, Jason, we have about $5 million at a house in cash in Orange County. And then you owe us like $4 million. So we're owed, we have like $9 million down here right now. And we would rather, you know... Um, get all that back up to Canada before we send more. So then he, he proceeds to tell me like, so in Canada, they don't use American dollar. They use a, a different Canadian form. dollar. Yep. So when, when they would ask me to drop off money on the Blackberry, they would sometimes give me a phone number and they would say, oh, you have, you know, 2 million to turn in. I said, oh yes. And so they would give me a phone number to somebody that would hardly speak English. And then oftentimes I was like, well, what is that? You know, like, what is that? And one day, sometimes I would do those like money drops myself. And so I would call a guy and he would be in Orange County and I would be, he would say, oh, let's meet at this grocery store. And one time I remember like the guy couldn't speak English very well and was like having me, you know, go here and go there. I finally just texted back the Canadians and said, I'm not meeting this guy. I can't even figure it out. This is like kind of crazy. So it turns out what they were doing is when I would give them that cash, they would meet with like amigos, like Mexicans, and they would buy cocaine. Oh, I see. So you never were direct, but you were, there was, there, they would, they would do something else with it. I got you. Right. But you yourself were, you, when you got busted, uh, you were, that it was just weed, exactly. that just weed, weed, weed. At, at one point though, they did ask me when I was in this meeting and they said, we can't send it to you anymore they kind of explained what they were doing and they were referring it to it as a wire transfer. So, you know, like me giving them the money and then they would buy that. They would refer to that as like a wire transfer. They're like, Hey, can you help us out? Like we can't get any of that at the moment. And I was like, well, that's not, that wasn't my thing. And I was definitely like against that. Right. So I was like, well, you know, I, I knew they couldn't send me any anymore. So I asked one of my customers who kind of, I knew that did that. And so uh, at the time I said, you know, hey, you know, they can't send me anymore. I was wondering if you could do that. And he's like, well, how many do you need? And I said, I don't know, like five million dollars worth. And he was like, oh, no, no. Like, that sounds like a setup, right? Like, that's like you're setting someone up to bust them or something, right? And he was like, oh, no, like maybe we can do one and we'll, we'll figure this out. So I was like, well, whatever it takes, I need to do it. And um, like the first time that transpired, I went and you know, checked into a hotel in LA with like a bunch of cash and would give him money and he would go and bring one back, go and bring one back. And that's where it so, got really bad. 
Is so are you, how long, first of all, how long were you doing this? This is a two part question. How long were you doing this? And at what point were you making the most money? How much was that? So how long did you do, how long were you in this career that you essentially just fell into? It fell into your lap. Sure, sure. so um, I, I would say like as a, even from like the age of 16, I was always like a, a regular cannabis smoker. Mm -hmm. And so it was very small point at that point, right? And I, I was a DJ back in the day, I had turntables. And so I was kind of just doing my thing. But as it got really like, um, very profitable, um, it got so much so profitable where I owned, you know, the, the window, sh the window tint shop, I got rid of it, because I was making so much and doing that. And I probably had a run of maybe like, seven years, five years. I was going to say that I just felt seven. Yeah, and, and, and all I did at that time was sell cannabis, and there so was nothing else. At the peak of your cannabis sales, what were you making, like, weekly and yearly? What was that? I would probably make um, two, two to $300,000 a week. That's amazing. <laughs> right? I mean, and, is that, is that, and that's, that's cash? and pure profit or is that yes cash and that's net not that's that's net not gross that's pure profit jesus two to three hundred thousand so what do you do how are you it became an addiction you, because there's so much money and if you what are you doing with two to two to three hundred thousand dollars a week what do you do with that um well oftentimes what i would do is like at that point i had uh, a lot of customers all over the, the united states for instance when I had the airplanes going, I would take it to St. Louis, Detroit, Ohio, Atlanta, Chicago, New Jersey, New York, Boston, mm. California, Seattle. I mean, it was all over America. Like I think I just did the math. That's fifteen million six hundred thousand dollars a year you were making. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So you were so, making you were making almost sixteen million dollars of cash a yeah. year. And did you do what they do in the movies, which is bury it in the walls? <laughs> did you have well, did you did you have a bank account? I mean, how yeah, the fuck did well, you do here's that? Here's where like here's where it all went kind of bad, and I didn't prepare because in the end, I always thought, oh, it's cannabis; it's nothing that serious. But as you're taking it over state lines, then it becomes a federal, and it becomes very serious. And so I always equated to you know I, I'm from Los Angeles, California. I've had friends that you know they go to like county jail for like a little stint. And oftentimes it's so overpopulated, you don't serve hardly any of your time. And so at the time, I really didn't know the difference between a federal prison and an L.A. County prison. So I had never been arrested in my entire life. Nothing but like traffic tickets. Right. So um, when I was making back to your question, when I was making that kind of money, I always owed this motorcycle club anywhere between three to like nine million dollars. Okay. Was my bill. Okay? okay. So oftentimes what I would do is I would, let's say, because I'm sending it all over America, like, you know, New York, Boston, Chicago, I would use my own money to cover what I gave to those people. So if I have a customer in Chicago and now I leave something with him and now he owes me 900 grand, I would use my own 900 and pay back the three to five million, like every every few days. Mm. So the customer that I owed, the, the, the boss, I guess you could say, they would always hit me up like every day, like how much do you have today? And so it was, a, a, I had to turn money in all the time. So, so you, needed times, the, you needed the money to be liquid and you needed it at your disposal. So you just kept it in your house? I always call it to like, like carry the market, you know, to, to keep the, the wheels turning, to re-up they call it. So you, so you were never doing like the shit you see in movies, which is burying it in your walls and any of that shit. <laughs> like in Ozark, I just saw Ozark, they're like burying it in the walls. You know, like, yeah, that's not happening, right? You're just really keeping it in a safe or something. Yeah, I, did, I had a safe. I always thought like, it's no big deal. So as I started to make that kind of money, I started to live like a very uh, affluent lifestyle. You know, so like um, I started buying, you know, my, my, I bought my own house in Manhattan Beach and, you know, that was a couple million dollars. I was I've always been like a Porsche uh, enthusiast ever since I had my shop. So I was always I had I've had like every single color. 
I've had, you know, the Harleys, the dirt bikes, the boats, the seat, <laughs> like right. everything you could ever want. And, and the price never mattered, you know? So mm. I literally had probably a couple million dollars at all times uh, with me. So even when I would travel, um, once I started having all these clients in all these other states, if I would travel to Atlanta, when I would touch down, I would call somebody that maybe owed me 500000 and I would say, oh, how much do you have? And they'd say, oh, I have 300. I'd say, oh, bring it over to my hotel. And so when they would, when I, they would come by, oftentimes I would take, go to the store and get a screwdriver and I would take the, the, the air conditioning vents apart and I would pack the hotel air conditioning events with, you know, like tons of cash while I was You know, there. I, I'm kind of remiss that I didn't know you then because you could have bought a couple of my paintings for a million cash. <laughs> and that wouldn't have been yeah, a crime right? for me because it would have been you paying for my painting and Absolutely. that would have been great. But unfortunately- And, and you know, I, I don't know, maybe at some point we can talk about this. <laughs> As I've studied the fine art world, people say that there's a lot of that that goes on with like rinsing money you know, not to give things away, but you know, it just, you know, and I'm yet to kind of like- Listen, <laughs> listen. Did, comprehend did, that. Let, let me take the state, let me take the soapbox for a sep second here, Sinister. Sure. The art world is probably as nefarious, if not more than the drug world, because they're doing it and getting away with a unregulated space an unregulated space. No rules, no laws. No rules whatsoever, except the rules that they decide are the rules. By it's the 1% like of the ivory tower elite who are deeming this important and this not important. And Christie's and Sotheby's is basically a channel to do many things, including not limited to laundering cash. So when people are moving large amounts of money, and look, it happens on the highest levels with nuclear weapons. There's a lot of times that there's a plutonium being transferred to somebody else in an organization who has a stolen Rembrandt painting. Now the Rembrandt is used as collateral for plutonium or weapons of mass right. destruction or bio warfare. Yeah. Picasso's, Rembrandt's, those are the two most stolen and valuable items on the black market in the art world. So look, all worlds have uh, these nefarious shadow pockets of them to them, dimensions. Sure. The art world is not anything in the, in the real art world. I'm not talking about the, the, the playground that I play in with, I got people that collect my work that are celebrities and musicians and ex-presidents, sure. whatever. That's legit because they're paying me money i'm getting taxed i'm paying the government a percentage of that money whether it's state federal or both depending on where the sale goes on and then they're getting a piece and then they can write it off it's all legal right because you can write it off if it's a, a part of interior decorating you can write it off but this we're not talking about that we're talking about like the world of pollock the world it's like one percent probably one percent the coons yeah. of the world you know quite honestly banksy he's in that game um, sure. There's people in that game. So that game is a, a whole other game. I tried, there was, there was a, one person that tried to launder uh, money by buying my work. And I, when I found out kind of what the schism was, like it felt like a schism. And I felt, I, I, could, <laughs> see, I could see the matrix of it. And sure. I started realizing the wine and dine and, and the history and the, and the track yeah. record of this person. There's a lot of money going to be spent on a lot of my paintings. And I just said, yeah, I can't do that. Because I knew that I was, you know, I was, I wasn't naive to it. So I didn't want to get involved in it because I already knew that um, it was bullshit. So anyway, that being said, uh, yeah, the art world is no different. The only thing is it's all legal and it's unregulated. Yeah, that's the only difference. And there's a very small amount of people that they will make sure the stocks rise on and other people that they will do what's, yeah, and then other people that they do what's called pump and dumping. They pump them up, and when it's there, they dump them, and then they, they ruin their career. There's a lot of that going on, and it's so, you know, it operates in the shadows, and, and it's, just a, it's just a high level game. And there's a lot of people making money in the game. Arbitrageurs, entrepreneurs, gallerists, uh, you know, experts, traders, buyers, <laughs> collectors, you know, yeah, and, for and sure. the art and the people who are collecting art can be very naive because they they buy things because there's a market value to them.
But the reality is the market value is arbitrary. Like, why is Basquiat more expensive than, you know, my work or, 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 work or like whoever? Now it's kind of Warhol. Right. Warhol is very expensive because it, it, there's, anyway, the point being that it's arbitrary. It's arbitrary who they decide to let in and it's arbitrary who they want to dump. It's all arbitrary, but it is calculated. It's an arbitrary calculation and they're dealing with billions of dollars. So, uh, so like there was a thing that I kind of learned some of this on, which was uh, like something about like a Russian oligarch that was buying tons and tons of stuff. And then his broker, he ended up like, you know, pressing charges or putting the an Interpol up on his, his art broker because he felt that he was getting ripped off because the broker would buy something for 18 million, call him and say, hey, I have this for 40 million, which is way above like the, the ethical amount to add for a commission, I guess, right? But you said there's no law, there's no rules. There's no, so yeah, there's like no, law. you know, there's no laws. That's the problem. It's like, you know, there's a problem with regulations, obviously, as we're seeing now in the world with what's, what's happening. And there's a problem with no regulations, you know, so there's got to be a balance. But the art world is like the wild, wild west, dude. It's like fucking crazy. So yeah. my advice to everybody is just buy what you love and create your own, like, loving collection. And there's a value there because it goes beyond money. It's spiritual. So, yeah. you know, like, and then you know what's fucking valuable. You fucking know in your heart a Van Gogh is like, it just hits you in your heart. A yeah. Monet hits you in your heart. A Michelangelo, there's some shit that's real. And then there's like fake shit. You can just feel it. You just know <laughs> that shit. Right. Do I have any other side business, Eric Baca? Hell no. I'm an artist. That's it. That's all I do. This is my side business right, right here. This is what I'm doing for no money at all is interviewing people that I find fascinating. And that's why Sinister Monopoly is here. Now, can I call you Sinister? Or what do you like yeah, to be yeah, called? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of friends, uh, like close friends, Sin? just call me Sin. OK, I can see that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Sin, here's the thing. So you're, you're rolling. You're making $16 million cash a year. And then it all starts to fall apart. I yeah. mean, it's, it's, coming, it's coming tumbling down. And at this point, I got to ask you this. Do you have like girls? Do you have like homies who are protecting you? Like, what is it? Do you are you creating an entourage at this point? Are you a little are you starting to get nervous? Because the more you make, I'm sure yeah. in your mind, you're like, there's only so many times you could roll the dice before somebody's going to snitch or something's going to happen or you're going to get caught. Tell, talk about that. For sure. So um, I, I was I was married before prior to my incarceration. Dear, and if I could really quickly just kind of say, I, I do like to say that, you know, I'm not really condoning and sensationalizing like what I've done. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that there's like a form of like, you know, doing the right thing as we get older and mature. And, and so I don't want to like encourage people to do what I did. I would rather them learn mm -hmm. from uh, my mistakes and realize that, you know, um, you don't have to take that route. Right. So, but with that being said, so I was, I was married at the time and, and I think it helped like me be more successful because mm -hmm. it kept me grounded. Like I wouldn't necessarily go to the nightclubs and be out, you know, okay. I did, when I traveled, you know, like let's say I would go to Atlanta, I would participate with my, my customers and going to, you know, the strip clubs and the clubs and stuff like that. But um, I tried to maintain like, uh, like somewhat of a, a humble in, in the sense that I wasn't, like lavishly partying, mm -hmm. if, that, if that makes any sense. Well, but you, yeah, you, were, you were married and, and, and obligated to the, to the covenant of your marriage, you're saying. Yeah, but when I would travel, um, I did sometimes uh, pay for a bodyguard just because, or multiple bodyguards, because it wasn't that much money at the end of the day. And I did spend a long time, a, a, a large part of my life uh, completely sober. No not smoking, not drinking. And I think that's what also allowed me to run this huge, like international organized, the, the government called it organ, transnational organized crime. And because I was at some, some point I was sober, I didn't smoke, I didn't drink. So, um, and then once I did, when I, when I had those bodyguards, they also like kind of worked as um, a sober driver. So I could pay him like $400 for the night. Some of them even had concealed weapons mm -hmm. and they would, you know, kind of go around with me. But 
for the most part, it's so weird because I have, I don't come across um, as like, a ga- I'm not a gang member. I have zero tattoos. I grew up like surfing and skateboarding. So, and, and then at one point before I started sending this, you know, with the airplanes into other states, um, because of the window tin shop, I would meet a lot of like, you know, African American people from, you know, the neighborhoods, you know, the hoods. And so as I started doing business with them, I'd, hey, you know, introduce me to some people and they would be like, hey, you don't want to come into our neighborhood. You're a beach kid. Don't do it. Mm-hmm. But for whatever reason, I think it was like part sociopath that I went into those neighborhoods. And this is when I was more hands on when I was younger. I would bring, you know, 20 pounds, 100 pounds into like Compton, South Central, yeah. you know, Inglewood and hang out with these people. And I would go by myself. And I would go into a room, like I remember one, one of my customers in Compton, every time I go to his house, and he literally, and this was before the word trap house, but mm. he operated a trap house. Every time I would go there, there would be like 10 people in the room. And I'm the only, you know, little white dude coming in the room. But a lot of times I would, I used to drive this, uh, this lifted Dodge um, truck and I had a Rottweiler and I would mm. always take my Rottweiler with me. Sometimes mm-hmm. that he would be off the leash and just come with me and I had him fully trained. So that was my sense of security. And then mm-hmm. I think people never really wanted to deliberately like stick me up with a gun because I would leave it with them. And, and it's kind of like, it's a cool vibe. Like, Hey, uh, I come over and just be like, here, take it, you know? So they don't have to, in the end, they could come back and say, Hey, you know, um, I gave some to this guy and he took off on me and didn't pay me. So when I would have that, um, worst case, I would maybe get like one of the big guys that I knew in the neighborhood and be like, hey, uh, I need you to go with me to have a a sit down with this guy. And and then Mm -hmm. at that point, um, I would do one or two things. If somebody owed me um, a a a large amount of money, I would say one, like what assets do you have that are paid for that you can give to me? Like, do you have a car with the title? Mm -hmm. Or what I would continue to do is work with them and say, okay, well, you take, you know, 10, 20 pounds at $3,200. Well, now you're going to take it at $3,400 and we're going to work towards, you know, paying off your debt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is crazy. So it reminds me of, I don't know if you ever saw True Romance. Which sounds familiar, but Christian I Christian Slater and Patricia Arquette. There's a scene where he walks, he walks into a, a, a crime house and Gary Oldman plays this really scary, nefarious dude. And so he's got to kind of navigate this creepy, you know some shit's going to go down and does yeah. go down. Yeah. Um, okay, so I have an interesting story with that. It just it comes up in my head. And, it, and for some people that do what I do or-, or Drexel, like, thank like, you, Whirlwind. Drexel was his name, Gary Oldman. Wait, Gary yeah. Oldman played Drexel, I think. Dude, that movie. Somebody said one of the best movies ever. Yeah, my boy Josh said that. But the, it's true. It was written by uh, Quentin Tarantino. He didn't want to direct it. And uh, Ridley Scott's brother, Tony Scott, wound up directing it. And it's got some of the best. Yeah, it's got some. Uh, yeah, that's right. He says it's white boy day when Christian Slater walks in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how funny. Yeah. And so there was an Tony interesting Scott, yeah. thing. This particular person who I mentioned previously, when I would go to his house, I started having to tell him like, hey, man, like, it's not cool that all these people are here. For one, like, I don't want one of those guys to potentially be an informant and then say, hey, it's this white dude that comes over. He's the one supplying this guy. I mean, it's really easy if for um, someone to surveillance this person's house and foresee, you know, th- this is the person he's getting it from really quickly. So that was one thing. And then this person actually did a short stint in like a, um, a county prison, a county jail. Mm-hmm. And before he went away, um, he asked me to keep his business going with his son. And, and he was actually very rare that he was a, a cash paying customer on the spot. I never had to leave it with him, what we call fronting him. So he like gave his son the money and I started seeing his son to continue his business well, he went away for probably like less than a year, you know, mm-hmm. a couple of months. So mm-hmm. um, I said, sure. When he came back, his son had had screwed off his dad's money and no longer had money to purchase from me. So I started giving it to him on a line of credit. Right. Mm-hmm. And then he ran up a debt and couldn't pay me back. 
So when the dad came out and the dad is like a gnarly, like, like a Vietnam old school, like an OG, he was an actual Crip gang member. He was a big dude. Like he's by no means somebody you really, <laughs> for me to go like push up on him, right? Right. So I remember being at his house and, and I had added a couple hundred dollars onto every pound that he would purchase. And one day he was like, no, I'm sick of this. I'm not paying for that. That's between you and my son. And he grabbed all of the weed I brought over. We we're in the kitchen and he's got his living room full of other guys. And he grabbed it all and like took off into the other room with it without giving me any money for it. And was basically like, I'm taking it. And I was like, man, like, so <laughs> what do I do? You know? And I just kind of had to stand my ground and I was like, Hey, so like, it's not going down like that. Like you're going to bring that back and I'm going to get my money. I can't really like show, um, that I'm not going to like back myself up as mm -hmm. even if it comes to being like physical, like obviously the guy would light me up, you know? Yeah, for but, sure. Yeah. So as I kind of like talked him down from doing that, he went back in the other room, brought it back. And then I said, well, why don't we do this? Like I'll cut half of the debt right now and I'll absorb half and you absorb half rather than you absorbing all of it. But you know, that's just, <laughs> so it's the price of doing business. Yeah. So when you when you finally got caught, I listened to your when you finally got caught story. Can you give us a cliff note quick version of how you got caught? Because I want to sure. know how you got caught. And then I want to know, uh, I'm already asking you questions in advance, but so, so you can think about it. Then I want to know where and how you went to jail and how long that was. And then when and then what was life like? outside of that. And I'm trying to get this all in a very short and, and time. And that's where I be, that's, I taught myself how to paint in the okay. of prisons as well. So. Okay. You um, got caught in Miami. Is that right? I got caught in Atlanta, Georgia. You got caught in Atlanta. Okay. Yeah. So talk about that. What's the, what's the cliff noted getting caught story? So what kind of springboarded uh, the whole investigation was prior to um, utilizing the airplanes, I started with big rigs. And so I knew a guy who operated um, a company and then he subbed out to all the truckers. He owned a freight company. Mm -hmm. And so um, I hired a, um, a guy that would crate stuff with wood. So it didn't seem like if I was just sending a 200 pounds to some degree is not like super big freight that you really need to have in a big rig. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That, that, that wouldn't really equate. So oftentimes I would have huge, you know, wooden crates made to make it look like, you know, oh, it needs a forklift to put it in. It's a big, big piece of freight. I started using a big rig and um, a person in Michigan, Detroit had gone to pick up the freight uh, when it when it arrived in Detroit. And as soon as he got it, he was just stormed by local police. Right? Oh, shit. And that's when you know, obviously what had happened was along the way, the big rig driver or something had got in trouble and just basically said, you know, hey, I'm drop. I, I don't even because technically the big rig driver was not getting paid for it. The the freight owner just was like saying, oh, you just hiring willy nilly drivers instead of like saying, hey, you know, I'll give you, you know, 10 grand, whatever. And then the guy can maybe hold his mud, we call it and you know not cooperate and just be like hey yeah it's me i did it and it ends here so anyhow the guy who you know got stormed on mm -hmm. that he started working with the the local police and at that point they let him go the same day and he had 100 pounds of um what what we what i had was indoor kush he had 100 pounds and what they told him is hey we have your gps in your car it was already on the windshield of where he was going and they said, we're going there anyways, but if you want to help yourself, you can take it there and we're going to fall back and we're going to like, you know, obviously seize everything when you're there. And he did that. And eventually um, when he did that, I had found out he was saying the reason he did it is because, you know, he didn't know those guys. He was just, it was like a blind date. You know, I, I he worked for me and I told him, go here and see those guys. So he, that made him feel easier to do something like to snitch on somebody because he thought he was getting himself out of something, which he did. You know, there's a saying called give up three, get set free. And these guys, you know, oftentimes do this, this type of thing. So 
they actually gave him back all of his cell phones and told him because he was actually not from Detroit. He was just landing there to kind of pick it up and, um, you know, take it over to my customer. And I paid this person a flat rate of $20,000 a month when I used big rigs to be a buffer. So the customer would never meet a big rig driver. Mm -hmm. You know, they would always meet this person, which was a buffer. So in case the big rig driver could try to like, you know, talk to them or do business, you're just like eliminating people superseding, you know, myself or, or whatever, if that, if there's any way to, right. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, once that investigation opened up, um, the guy um, was even in my paperwork from the federal government. He, he was paid $1,100 to drive out in front of my house and say, that's where he lives, you know? So he started working with them and I knew that he had gotten busted. So it, it was something where I just kind of like, I, I paused, I took a hiatus, I, I cleaned house and I told everyone we're gonna just kind of like stop for a while. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the, the money became an addiction. It became so bigger than myself, my organization, to where somebody approached me and said, hey, Jason, I know a pilot. I met the pilot and he was a guy in his 60s. And he was like, I'll go anywhere, I'll meet anyone, I'll, you know, whatever. So I started using a pilot. But during the time I was using the pilot, I was already known within the, you know, the, the drug enforcement agency. You know, and I taught myself how to look for these vehicles. And then I taught my, my wife how to look for the vehicles. And I started spotting them around, but kind of being like a cannabis or a sociopath or being doing it for so many years, it didn't equate because I wasn't busted busted. But when you see, you know, a minivan all blacked out with like four antennas on it, and you're like, well, why is this car down the street? It's not stopped, but it's driving around like still circling and it has four antennas. And Do you think that if you would have got out after the driver thing, when you said, let's dismantle before you hired the pilot, do you yeah. think you, you would have got away with I this? Do. I do. You would have just got away because they wouldn't have had enough incriminating evidence, right? Yeah. And, and, and but you got, I, you, got, you got hungry. You were still greedy for the money. The addiction was there. I did. I did. And even at my sentencing, the judge told me that. He said, you know, Jason, you had an opportunity to stop and you didn't stop because I, I prepared a letter at my sentencing and, you know, of like remorse and, and I was trying to be apologetic and, you know, you know, trying to like help myself in my situation through, you know, like being uh, regretful and taking accountability for my actions. And the judge was like, no, you know, you had, you had a chance to stop and you didn't. Mm. And so, you know, that was something that came up at sentencing. So you, so when, when you got busted, tell me that, where that was, I mean, you know, try to condense it, but like what happened and were you shocked or did you kind of know that they were setting you up? I kind of knew because um, there was a precursor to the actual, the day of where I was, you know, put into handcuffs. So um, through the big rig, um, it opened up an investigation and they're begin they're, they started doing, you know, wiretaps. They started, you know, doing like long distance photography and videos when I would meet with somebody at like a hotel, I have all of this footage from fighting my case, they give you compact disc. And all of those compact discs have, you know, phone calls, they have videos. But did you see everything. them doing this or you had no idea? No, to some degree, I had no idea. Okay. Every now and then I would get an inclination like, that's really weird. That's a strange vehicle. And that doesn't seem right. And, you mm -hmm. know, but I just I kept going. So um, mm -hmm. in, 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 in the meat and potatoes of the investigation, it just became really huge, right? And so um, I, I was traveling one day and I was in Cleveland, Ohio, and I had to go there because the customer I would see, he, he was very adamant about saying, I'll never meet your pilot. I will only meet you, Jason. So the, the pilot would come to Cleveland, Ohio, give me his room key. And there would be like hundreds of pounds of kush in his hotel room. So my customer, so um, I remember leaving, you know, on a commercial flight from Ohio to Atlanta. And I was calling my wife on her cell phone. And it was like going like straight to voicemail. So I called the landline at my house back then, you know, everyone, we had landlines back then. And a guy answered the phone. 
And to me, I was like, at that time, I didn't have any wife or kids. She should have been home alone. And I was like, well, who's this? And he was like, oh, this is agent so-and-so from the drug enforcement. We're here doing a raid on your property. And I was like, oh, really? And he was, like, he was like, where are you? I said, oh, I'm out of town. He's like, well, uh, when can you be here? And I said, oh, uh, I won't be there for a while. And he's like, well, tell me where you are. We'll send someone over to, to we just want to talk to you. And I was like, no, that, you know, that won't be happening. And he's like, well, then we have nothing else to talk about. And I was like, okay. And then I, and I even just said respectfully, you know, for any reason that you're there has nothing to do with my wife. And I would expect if you, you know, treat her with respect, she's a female, you know, and I already knew in my head, like how this was playing out. There's probably 20 officers all SWAT teamed out inside my house. And I was actually in an Atlanta hotel when that had happened. And I had a pretty good um, base of, of people that were in my crew in Atlanta. And I got really worried instantly that they could track my credit card to the fo to the hotel I was in, track my phone. So of course they I could, could, right? I mean, yeah, but like, come on, man, right? They knew and exactly so where they probably knew exactly where you were when you were like, I'm not telling you where I am right now. They were like, Yeah. <laughs> They're like watching you on video, like, yeah, okay, cool, Jason, that's cool. Yeah, don't tell us. I mean, they right. had to, right? Totally. So I got off the phone and I had already um, had a lawyer because of my nefarious activity with, you know, people like if a friend got caught, I would use my own lawyer so I could um, find out if they were cooperating because he's my lawyer and I'm paying for it. He would disclose, oh, yeah, they're going to court today or they're doing this. So. I always had a lawyer in communication. So I instantly called that lawyer and he was like, let me see what's going on. Let me do make some calls and, and so on. At the same time, I called somebody in Atlanta and I was like, hey, I need a place. I need to, I have to go somewhere. And so they were like, okay, we'll send somebody. And he sent like his girlfriend or something. And you know, um, they took me to a house and I was like hanging out in a house for a few days, communicating with the lawyer, like what's gonna happen? How is this going down? And so I, I kind of wore out my welcome at this young lady's house. I didn't want to be somewhere. So I eventually jumped on Craigslist and I got a house like in the middle of the woods. I mean, there is nothing around in this house. And I'm out there and I had like a few million dollars in cash. And at any given time, I had like seven or to 10 cell phones. And so I'm like all by myself with millions in cash and just, just phone guy. Oh my you know, God. And then as I was like, um, as I would explain to some of my people in my network, like this had happened, which was the wrong thing to do because now they start thinking, Oh, well, he's out. I need to keep the money that I owe him because I still have to continue, you know, my earning money. So a lot of people get scared and they have, we were using prepays. So some people at that point would even just throw the prepaid away and be like, Oh, I don't want nothing to do with Jason, you know? And I was just trying to give them a heads up, like, yo, make sure your house is clean. <clears throat> make sure you're you know you don't have but you know that, but that was a mistake on your part right it was actually yeah and so as do I'm you think at that point let me ask you this do you think at that point you could have with your couple of millions just disappeared into sure. uruguay sure. and become like you know like trevor i, blah, I blah, actually blah. know someone that was on my level that has done that Okay. And they've actually been, <laughs> when I've spoken to them not long ago, and it was like, you know, they're traveling countries and actually doing like, they seem happy. Okay. You know? So I absolutely, and then my Canadian connections, and then I had, you know, uh, Me Mexican, um, you know, connections, right? So when that happened, I was in contact with my lawyer for quite a, quite a long time. And my lawyer kept saying, come to LA and I'll arrange for you. And I, and I said, no, no, I'm not getting on a commercial flight. Even though I had my own airplane, even my pilot was like, I'll fly you back, you know, so you're, you don't get arrested at, the, at a, an Atlanta airport. And so I kept telling my lawyer, I said, no, the only way I'll come back is if you get prearranged a bail amount and I know that I'm going in, I'm getting arrested and I'm bailing right out. I, okay. I'm not gonna go and, and just, you know, cause I, I, I still, had a major network that operated where I could be in a, in a cave and it would still, you know, exist. So then the lawyer, um, when I was in Atlanta, I had um, like what, like a hierarchy person that worked for me. And then eventually 
I, ha I jumped on Craigslist and had them go rent a lake property that was real rural, and, and it, it was really um, upscale, a beautiful property. And so I had him rent it his name and transfer stuff in his name, and I just kind of like hunkered down at um, on a lake in, in Atlanta, and I was communicating with my lawyer. And so the person that rented that property, he was going around to his customers and he would even refer to me as his boss. And he didn't know it, but he already had hooks in him from an Atlanta informant that worked with mm -hmm. the FBI in Atlanta, mm -hmm. but they didn't know who I was, mm. right? So then the, he had already done what's called a control buy through his informant. Well, anyhow, the person that was renting me properties and he, he was buying me boats for my lake and stuff like that, he, um, he was going around telling his clients, oh, my boss had this, my boss got raided. And so he was putting my business in his network and his network was tainted and already um, uh, compromised. Mm. So his informant went back to his, what they call his FBI handler. And they said, oh, this guy, Jason, he just got raided. So the, the FBI in Atlanta contacted the Los Angeles group that had raided my house. The Los Angeles group decided to um, not file any charges. When they came to my house in the, in the FBI, it's called a criminal complaint. It was not an actual indictment. So there's a, like, I think they're kind of waiting to see and get, gather more evidence. It was not, I wasn't actually a warrant. And so there's a difference between a complaint and a warrant. Mm. So um, then the, the Atlanta FBI had convinced them to let me go and let's watch him. They, they said, oh, now we know where he is. Mm -hmm. We found out he's in a lake property. So then when my lawyer calls me one day and he's like, hey, Jason, I just got a call from the prosecutor. They're not going to be filing any charges on you. That's another reason when the judge came to me and said, you had the chance to stop. And for me, you know, I'm a Christian and I was praying and I was like, oh, you know, what a blessing. Like there must not have been enough evidence at my house because in my, my house in Manhattan Beach, I had a couple hundred thousand in cash mm -hmm. and then they took like Harley and Porsche and all these sort of things, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I thought, well, at this point, I'm going to step back and I'm going to have someone take my business over for me. Mm -hmm. And it took a little while because a lot of my customers didn't want to, you know, didn't want to kind of do that. They still wanted to interact with me. And then it was difficult to find someone that could actually run my entire business for me. Mm -hmm. Right. And so um, I thought when, when the lawyer called and said, hey, there's no charges, I was like, okay, now I can move around again. And so it was a very interesting story. And I remember it was 2010 on Cinco de Mayo. Um, I, I flew to Ohio to meet with that customer that said, I will only ever meet you. And I, and I jumped on a private jet. It was like 14,000 for a, a two-way trip. And when I got there, um, the uh, Atlanta like informant, they were the ones that bought the plane for me. Because I wouldn't get a plane myself. I would call my customer and say, hey, Give me a plane. And then, you know, they always owed me money. So he got me a plane. So as I touched down in Ohio, Ohio now knows that I'm there, right? And so I go to check in my hotel and I'm seeing weird things. And I have a car service drop me off and there's people in the hotel. And I remember like waiting for my customer. He, he was there be long before the pilot was arriving. Man, and you I, had two chances to get the fuck out. You were like, I'm I, getting right back in this motherfucker. Yeah. Well, when I did go to Ohio, I brought someone with me to meet to my customer. And I was going to, and I tried to tell him like, hey, like my, the time has come where I'm, I'm washing my hands and, and I'm going to have you meet this new person. And from now on, you'll, you'll work with them and we'll, we'll no longer communicate. And so he was like, no, no, I don't want to. I'm not ready. And I remember the hotel that I checked into, there was a, a shopping mall across the street. And I went over there to kill some time. And dude, they were following me everywhere I went in the mall. And the guy that was on the private jet with me, my friend, I told him, I was like, dude, these guys are following us everywhere we go. Mm. And I remember we were like, you know, doing all these weird moves going in. We went to like Sears and then we went to the, the exit doors. And we just turned the corner on the exit where you to the parking lot real quick. And my friend started like smoking a cigarette. 
And this guy comes walking out who had been clearly following us in and out of every store. And, and at that point, he wasn't going to a car. So he didn't even know what to do. Like he's sitting on the curb and he doesn't even have a bag. And, and my friends were like smoking a cigarette, but we knew we were like watching him. And I was like, wow, that's really strange, you know? Like, and then he didn't even really know where to go. It wasn't like he was randomly going to his car, leaving the mall. And that's, and, and, that, and that's where they, I'm not, not rushing you, but we, we only have five minutes left, but that's, did they arrest you there in the mall? No, so that was just kind of going, I, I didn't realize we had five minutes. So um, eventually it was a massive um, uh, surveillance thing, internet, you know, through multiple states. You know, eventually mm -hmm. when I traveled to Chicago, the Chicago FBI followed me all over when I, and they had Seattle. And next thing you know, there's FBI all over the United States tracking everyone that I'm working with. Wow. And so eventually um, I was in Chicago and all of a sudden I had all these transactions that were transpiring in one day. You know, I had like 400 pounds landing in Detroit, uh, some other ones, all of the phones went dead. I don't know if you know when you call a cell phone and it doesn't ring, it's powered off. And to me, I always knew that's a sign that someone's in trouble. Yeah. I called um, my lawyer and he's like, and I gave him some names to all the people that phones were dead. And he's like, yeah, there's an indictment and it has 32 people on it. And he's like, your name's not on it. So I jumped in a car and took off to Atlanta because I had a passport at that house. And I kind of hung around Atlanta for like almost a full month. And when the indictment went from all these other states, it was like, they called it um, Jason's Syndicate. And it went live in one day, like it was an international ring, multi-state raid all at like, you know, 10 in the morning, like New York mm -hmm. raids, Chicago raids, Seattle raids. So they just rounded all y'all motherfuckers up at the same time. But I stayed loose because I was in almost like an Airbnb. I was in a vacation rental. So I, back, I beat feet to Atlanta and I was staying at, at someone's house. And eventually I had some cars I was having customized in Atlanta and the FBI came to that body shop and the owner said, oh, here's his phone number. And it was a brand new throwaway and they tracked that phone. And eventually after me trying to like hunker down for a month and trying to figure, am I going to Canada? Am I going? I actually had booked um, a flight to go to London the day that I was apprehended. And so when they came, they came to a house in Atlanta with full on, you know, machine guns, every organization, the DEA, the FBI, the, the GBI, which is the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, you know, helicopters, you know, the whole enchilada. And um, basically it was, it was just kind of like, it was a wrap, you know? And at that point um, I was denied bail, even though I've never been arrested in my life. And you know, people, they treated me as if I was like, I committed a murder. When, when they, they were estimating the time amount I should get, like they call it pre-sentencing report, yeah. the prosecutor suggested I get 30 years. So we only have one minute, yeah. but what jail did you go to and, and how long did you serve? Um, I, I was sentenced to just under 12 years. And so originally I started off in the Atlanta Penitentiary and then I was shipped over to California in San Pedro to Terminal Island. And Terminal Island has a hobby shop, and which allowed me to buy art supplies. And that's where I started, you know, buying canvas and paints. And I literally painted six years, seven days a week, and just honed my skills and just kept, you know, grinding as an artist and, you know, kept trying. And, that's and that I had my, I learned about you while I was in prison from your TV show that you hosted. Oh, wow. And I had my mom mail in your book. <laughs> and so I was like, you know, I was trying to teach myself the whole thing. Wow, know? that's amazing. Yeah. Dude, yeah. We're, we're, we'll do it. You know what we're going to do? We're going to do a part two. But in the meantime, awesome. uh, everybody can check out his stories at Free Shout, uh, Fresh, oh, Fresh Out Series. Fresh Out Series. Uh, yeah. I pinned it. I've been pinning that. So awesome. everyone can check out your story. And thanks for putting me on, Justin. And I'm a huge fan of yours. I Thank you, brother. Well, yeah, no, we're going to we'll, we'll do a part two. Maybe we'll even do it this week to keep it fresh. So no, let's, hit, let's do it. Let's do it this week. And um, and then we'll just get into it and then talk about because we didn't really talk about your art. We'll talk For about sure. your jail and, and the whole thing. And, you know, yeah. and uh, and then we'll just get For everybody out there. Stay out of trouble. Don't do what I did. I'm going to go sell some weed right now. No, okay. <laughs> yeah, no. I, you and it's know. crazy that it's legal now, right? I know. Right. After all of that. And now it's legal. Yeah. It's crazy. You wouldn't right. be apprehended anymore. You're doing something legal. Love yeah. you, bro. 
Well, hey, thank you, Justin. Yeah, for sure. We'll get on it, and then everybody else will tune in this week. We'll figure out probably Thursday or something. We'll get you back on. All right, guys. Peace. All right, peace. God bless. Peace, peace.